<laughs> okay, so two shortish, hopefully shortish presentations for today. Um, I wanted to kind of take off on from what we were talking about or working with in the Rock Lab this this week and, and last, uh, and relate that a little bit to Mars and some of the differences we see between Earth and Mars. So, you know, and very important in organizing our thoughts about the kinds of rocks and minerals we see in areas, the kind of geological formations and what they're made of, all ties back to this idea of the rock cycle, which is kind of the basis for what we're playing around with the rocks. Okay, so in terms of rock, main, major rock types here on the Earth and elsewhere, what are we talking about for the major types of rocks? What are the three categories of rock types? Igneous. Igneous. Metamorphic, Metamorphic and sedimentary. sedimentary. Okay, where do igneous rocks come from? Volcanoes. I mean, basically... Uh, the definition of an igneous rock is, of course, uh, a rock that has crystallized from molten material. So if we talk about magma underneath the earth or lava once that magma breaches the surface, it is fully melted and then igneous rocks crystallize out of that uh, material. Now, um, sedimentary rocks. What or what characterizes sedimentary rocks? How do they form? Sediment. Sediments are important, right? Sediments get, compacted. Sediments get compacted or glued together with uh, salts or other chemicals. Um, the sediments can be brought together or or deposited by either water processes, carrying materials around, dumping that material into uh, a, um, a lake or ocean basin. Sediments can also be gathered up by wind processes, and that's going to be very important on Mars. Uh, but essentially, those sediments have to be deposited, collected together, and then something sticks them together into a format that is hard enough that we can eventually pick it up as a rock. Okay? Like if you went to a sand dune and you picked up a handful of sand, you would not call that a sedimentary rock because there's nothing holding it together. And that, that glue can be just the compaction from uh, pressure <coughs> or chemical um, uh, processes could be involved with precipitations of salts or you know, other, other chemical aspects. Now, what type rock types can those sediments come from? Any. Any. Okay. Igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, metamorphic rocks, they all can be turned into sediments by what kinds of processes? Erosion. Weathering, erosion, chemical breakdown, you know, all that stuff can break down any of those rock types leading to a deposition of sediments that can then eventually be formed into sedimentary rocks. So what, what are we talking about now with metamorphic rocks? How are those different? Uh, they're kind of like melted stuff under the earth. Yeah, but not fully melted because then we would be producing igneous rocks, right? right? They're like, um, Okay, so metamorphosis in general means what? Change. Change, okay. Uh, Kafka's metamorphosis, guy changes into a big cockroach, right? Uh, with metamorphic rocks, we're talking about pre-existing rocks, whether they're igneous or sedimentary or in some cases even metamorphic rocks, not being fully recycled into magma to be recrystallized, but experiencing enough heat and enough pressure that those rocks get changed. So they're clearly no longer granite. They're clearly no longer sandstone. Uh, they've been turned into, you know, the metamorphic um, 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 
equivalent of, of those rock types. And then igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks can all be recycled down through the Earth's crust and into the mantle to be remelted into magma. So we've got this cycle, and on the Earth we see you know, substantial uh, deposits, geological formations involved with all of these different rock types. Okay, so, you know, lava fields in Hawaii or um, Craters of the Moon National Park up in the northwest, you know, you can see extensive areas of lava field, basaltic formations, uh, and so forth. Um, the White Cliffs of Dover in, um, along the English Channel in Great Britain would be what kind of rock? have any chalk here, but sedimentary. sedimentary, okay, so these are limestone deposits, um, sandstones, um, you know, we see extensive sedimentary deposits, metamorphic rocks, uh, much of the rock you see during, uh, in the road cuts around here uh, are various kinds of metamorphic rocks, um, New York has had a fairly um, interesting geological history. There's been a lot of, of compression and tectonic activity that has taken pre-existing rock types and formed them into metamorphic rocks. There's a lot of gneiss and you know, other kinds of metamorphic rocks um, around, uh, around our local region here. Now I'm going to apply or talk a little bit about some different uh, sites on Mars for most of this talk, but I first want to kind of go back to the rock lab that we did. What kinds of rocks did we look at in the rock lab? Sedimentary? Metamorphic? No. All igneous, okay. And that was by design. Um, the, these igneous rocks work out well for the quantitative aspect of the lab where you're collecting data on you know, weight and volumes to calculate density. So you know, it's good for the, for the lab in that respect. But also, uh, igneous rocks are going to be um, much of what we see on Mars. Um, there is, in general, a lot less of the Martian landscape that you would be driving along and saying, oh, there's metamorphic rock. And we'll talk about why that is uh, later. Um, there are important sedimentary rock formations on Mars, but uh, as we'll see, most of what we've seen so far has been igneous rocks. Why in general do you think that we'd have more of a preponderance of igneous rocks on Mars compared to sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. Uh, there's a lot more uh, volcanic activity on Mars, and also there's no real water to create sedimentary. Okay, so, so there's, there's a lot less weathering going on on Mars now than there is on the Earth. Uh, there is some wind erosion, but there's certainly not a lot of, of, of water-based erosion and, and uh, chemical weathering that goes along with it. There can be earthquakes, but uh, we would predict that there would be fewer earthquakes on Mars than on the Earth. Um, there's actually, um, the most recent Mars mission from NASA is the MAVEN mission, which is studying the atmosphere, but the next m mission coming out of NASA is uh, a lander, not a rover, just a stationary lander called InSight. And it will be specifically focused on these geophysical properties. So it will be measuring <coughs> earthquakes. It will be measuring heat flow, heat transfers coming up from, uh, from the depths to the surface. Um, but you know, Mars is not completely dead, so um, there would not be there would still be some earthquakes, <coughs> not to the extent that's on the Earth. Was that? Have, um, have I? You mean worked on something like a seismometer, or actually no? 
you know. Like I said, my background it was biology, then college administrator, and I'm really just fascinated with Mars, which is you know, why I'm teaching it. Um, so as we'll, the, as the material for next time we'll cover, there's less or no tectonic activity on Earth. It's really that tectonic recycling that's involved in forming these large deposits of metamorphic rock. So on Mars we would not expect to see the same huge geological formations of metamorphic rock that we see here on the Earth. Uh, for those deposits of sedimentary rock, that we're looking at. Uh, primarily, though, many of those are ancient deposits from back when Mars was more active in terms of a water cycle and weathering and so forth. And so we'll talk about that. Um, you know, I'll provide a couple of examples today, but we'll talk about those in more detail when we talk about uh, you know, reconstructing the history of, of water on Mars. So we focused on igneous rocks, and um, this diagram puts together a lot of what we looked at with the igneous rocks. And before I just go through and talk about this, I'm going to hand you out a copy of it. And I want you to put your name on the back and a line down the middle. And then I want you to just see <coughs> what kind of interpretation you can make of this diagram, just given the diagram itself. Okay, um, so somebody volunteer some interpretations of this diagram. Um, it's an igneous rock makeup chart. It's like a bunch of characteristics about stuff. Okay, that's basically what it is. It's, uh, give, it's giving you a graphical representation of the diversity of igneous rock types that we see and organizing them how. Okay, least dense, let me get a pin up here. Least dense where? Least dense um, by the potassium feldspar, like the edge where the key of the graph is all the way to the end. The, uh, the felsic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. Okay, so we've got, basically, we have some description of felsic rocks, which are the more granitic rocks, granite and, and rhyolite. Um, we've got the more mafic, and I didn't pull out into lab. There's actually even denser, denser rock types called ultramafic. And then these, you know, so that would be the, the gabbro and the basalt that we looked at in lab. Uh, generally speaking, would be denser than the felsic rocks. And the uh, andesitic rocks, the intermediate rocks, the diorite and andesite, generally speaking, kind of fall somewhere in between. Now, um, that's essentially talking about you know what's displayed here. What's going on with this large part of this diagram? What makes a mafic or ultramafic rock an ultramafic rock? What are the minerals that are generally found in these denser mafic and ultramafic rocks? Pyroxene. Pyroxene, olivine. Okay. So these minerals in general are denser than quartz and feldspar, which are fairly lighter minerals. And the fact that the felsic rocks have a higher proportion of these less dense minerals, you know, is the reason why the rocks are less dense. And uh, you know, remember, these rocks are all crystallizing out of a melt, out of a molten lava magma melt. And depending upon the composition of that melt, how much silicate is in the melt versus other uh, ions, how much, um, how much iron and magnesium are in the melt compared to potassium and, and lighter ions, 
Um, those are going to, and also somewhat the temperature and pressure at which the rock is solidifying, all of those things will influence the actual rock that ends up somewhere on the surface to be picked up by a geologist or someone who's just interested in rocks. Um, what do these, what does this part of the diagram tell you? More metallic meaning the increasing iron, magnesium, and calcium. Yeah. Okay, because you know potassium and sodium are also technically metals, uh, but the iron, magnesium, and calcium would be heavier, and the potassium and sodium would be lighter. So you can't say you know just simply it's more metallic as you go to the right, but the Metal ions, the metallic ion uh, part of the minerals, does vary in composition, going from more, uh, more potassium and sodium in the felsic rocks to more iron and magnesium and calcium in the, in the mafic rocks. Silica is also relatively less dense, and we see an increasing proportion of silica the more we get over to the uh, mafic side. What about this last arrow down here at the bottom? Okay, so Okay, so if we had a blast furnace down the lab, we could actually play around with melting some of the rock samples we were playing around with last time, and we would find that the granites would melt at a lower temperature than the gabbro. Okay, so just quickly want to run through some different sites uh, where uh, we've got experience with on Mars to relate this back to the rock cycle. I mean, basically we have only landed uh, in a handful of places around Mars so far. Uh, starting with the Viking landers, which were back in the 70s, our first well, actually the Soviets uh, beat us to the surface of Mars just barely although their probe didn't function for very long and so got, I don't know, a few minutes worth of observations before something happened to it. Uh, the, Viking, the two Viking missions in the 70s were very successful, both landers and orbiters. And then we had a big break because everyone got bored with Mars because it looked like it was dead and not interesting. And then we went back in the 90s with Pathfinder and... Um, you know, the Opportunity and Spirit Rovers, the Phoenix uh, mission, and now we have, uh, now we have uh, Mars Science Laboratory or the Curiosity mission in Gale Crater. So we, we've got a handful of sites on Mars that we're getting up close and personal with. So how do they relate to these different rock types? Okay, so the Viking 1 landing site was in Chrysi Planitia. Um, which is a um, northern lowland site at the, uh, sort of at the uh, mouth of this outwash channel. And unfortunately, I can't. No way. I'd like to kill this front bank of lights. Um, mostly igneous volcanic rocks and sand and, you know, the regolith, which is Martian word for soil because we can't really call it soil because soil has living material as well as dead material. Um, so mostly igneous rocks here. There's not really any metamorphic or sedimentary rocks. Uh, same thing with the Viking 2 landing site. 
in Utopia Planitia, which in the Star Trek universe is where there will be a big uh, construction base where the Enterprise was uh, originally built. Um, again, I mean, what do you see? I mean, you can't see much because it's washed out, but you see a, a lot of volcanic looking rocks and sand which is probably broken down volcanic rocks and uh, you know dust and everything in between. So, you know, we didn't actually send the Vikings to areas that were all that very interesting and probably not the best place to look for life, which is what the Viking missions did. When we went to uh, back to Mars with the Pathfinder mission, uh, I'm going to kill the lights so you can see these. Better? Um, this again was at the uh, mouth of an outwash channel. You can see, based on all these uh, streamlined uh, morphologies, that there was a bunch of water that rushed out of here. The idea would be that... Um, you know, this, this sample, this area would have sampled a lot of different rock types. But again, um, you know, we see a lot of basalt, cementite, mostly various different kinds of igneous rocks. When we went uh, with the <coughs> Spirit and Opportunity rovers, the Mars Exploration Rover Program, the focus was on looking for um, rock formations that would show the action of uh, past water in, um, in ancient Mars' history. Um, Spirit was targeted at Gusev Crater, which looked to be from orbit a very promising site because it looked like that it's a crater, an old crater, that at one time had this, what looks like a river valley flowing into it. So if there was a river valley flowing into this crater, what kind of a habitat would you expect to have seen, ha had in the crater? Uh, sedimentary rock? Yeah, sedimentary rock, but what would have, in what environment would that sedimentary rock have been laid down? Aquatic. Aquatic. This looks like an ideal place to have a lake on ancient Mars. You've got a round hole in the, in the Earth, in the Mars, uh, and you've got a river flowing into it. So, you know, naturally we would expect that there would have been a lake there, lakes leading to sediments, and sediments forming sedimentary rock, which would be great for looking for eventually, you know, past life, if there was life. Well, when, um, when Spirit touched down, and they dealt with some technical issues that you'll read about in the text uh, and got the rover off of the landing unit. Um, the first rock it went to uh, assay was this rock called Adirondack and uh, it turned out to be basic volcanic rock. Uh, a lot of basaltic and related materials. If Gusev Crater at one point was a lake that laid down lake sediments. Clearly at some point in the past the whole uh, surface of the crater had been covered over by fresh lava flow and if there was any sedimentary rock it would be meters down below the surface and not accessible to the Spirit Rover, which was you know really kind of depressing. Um, these rovers were meant to last for 90 sols you know, 90 plus days of operation. And turned out that all of, basically all of the local rocks in the area where Spirit touched down were, I don't want to say boring igneous rocks, but if you're going to look for ancient lake bottom sediments, you know, after you've measured about five or six or eight igneous rocks, you get kind of... Uh, kind of bored with the whole process. Uh, so even though they never thought they would make it, they sent Spirit going off to these hills in the distance, the uh, Columbia Hills, which are named after the uh, Columbia astronauts that were lost in the, in the shuttle uh, accident. And um, to everyone's surprise, Spirit and Opportunity actually lasted for years on Mars. Opportunity still going. 
Spirit lasted for, again, this is off the top of my head, so don't write it down, six, seven years. Um, and made it to Columbia Hills, found a uh, much more uh, interesting diversity of rocks uh, than just a volcanic plain filling up a crater basin. Um, one of the biggest um, discoveries was actually uh, Spirit developed a bum wheel, and so one of its wheels it was just kind of dragging along the surface, uh, and as it was doing so, it kind of cut a trench, and in various locations it came across this uh, silica material that would have been modified by hydrothermal water activity. So that was um, one of the key points of the spirit mission. We'll talk about those missions in more detail when we get to talking about water. Hills on the edge of the crater? No, no, no. Well, No, I think they're in the crater. Uh, I mean, this thing's like big, right? It's like Gusev Crater is huge, yeah. yeah. There's no way that Spirit would have, I mean, even if, even if Spirit were alive today, I don't think it would have had the distance to get out of Gusev Crater. It's a fairly large structure. Uh, opportunity was directed to uh, Mariani Planum. And it actually landed in a very small, tiny crater in the middle of this big plain. And uh, was much luckier than Spirit. It found bedrock immediately, which is, this is the first site on Mars where the geologists could actually look at the rocks in place in the you know, kind of natural situation that they formed under. Um, and uh, right away, uh, Opportunity found evidence for uh, watery environments in terms of these uh, sedimentary layers that were laid down. Uh, we'll talk about that in more details. Uh, we talked, uh, found also these, what they called blueberries, little rocky concretions, which... You know, the formation of these rocky structures by concretion, that is itself a sedimentary process. Um, so, uh, right off the bat, uh, Opportunity was finding much more interesting uh, material. Here is the Burns formation in um, Endurance Crater. One of the next uh, major locations Opportunity went to. What do you see in this diagram? In the diagram or in the well, in the picture. Okay. Layers? Layers. Okay. Layers are interesting. Okay. You don't, I mean, you could have, you, you could build up layers of volcanic material with one lava flow after the other after the other. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, you see layering like that, it's, it's a good indication to look for, you know, it's just a sedimentary formation. Colin? Um, so with the volcanoes on Mars, they don't believe there was much ash that would fall? Um, if it would, would it just be, like, embedded in the there, there certainly could be ashy eruptions. If we look at the main volcanic structures, like the Tharsis Montes and so forth, they're all fairly shallow shield volcano structures, which you get not from violent pyroclastic explosions, but by more gentle, you know, bubbling up of magma turning into lava flowing across the surface. Now, I'm not saying that there's never been, there clearly, um, I mean, if you look around Hellas Basin, there's clearly some material that looks eroded in the way that you would s expect uh, a material that is composed of a lot of volcanic ash to erode away. Um, it may have been back in the Hesperian that there might have been more, uh, a higher frequency of, of more violent pyroclastic explosions. But the, the main volcanic provinces we see on Mars today mostly tend to be those fairly gentle shield volcano structures. 
Uh, in the case of Burns Formation, we're talking about, um, well, Aeolian wet sand sheets. So what does that all mean? It means uh, sand, layers of sand blown around by the wind, uh, sediments deposited by, in this case, mostly wind-driven processes, that later became exposed to water, either groundwater percolating up or maybe surface water, and that water would have cemented the sand sheets together into this uh, sedimentary rock formation um, and um, probably chemically modified, uh, definitely chemically modified the uh, composition of the, of the formations uh, with increased exposure to the groundwater. Uh, Opportunity's been going, it's just uh, uh, been the Energizer bunny of Mars rovers uh, over 10 years and it's still um, going, although NASA has zeroed out its budget for next year, so unless something changes in the budget process, there will be no more money to run Opportunity. Uh, and now it's at this huge endurance crater which uh, is um, also a site where they're looking for water-based uh, sediments, clays, and so forth. Here's just a, a view of the uh, landscape at Endurance Crater. Um, generally speaking, Opportunity Spirit, most of the landers land in boring places and they have to travel to get to more interesting terrain and after 10 years Opportunity has finally gotten to some very interesting terrain. Um, just a quick comment about uh, the Curiosity Rover and Gale Crater. Um, Gale Crater was interesting because in the middle of the crater is this Mount Sharp edifice, which um, is a mountain in terms of it's probably, well, definitely layers of sediment that had been laid down four to five kilometers in depth and then sculpted away to leave this kind of central peak. So the focus of the Curiosity mission is to look at the sequence of sedimentary layers in the Mount Sharp to see how the environmental conditions that gave rise to those sedimentary layers changed over time. And we'll talk about this again much more uh, when we get to um, looking at past water and environments on Mars. And then last slide, I have no examples of us up close and personal with metamorphic rocks on Mars. As we talked about, Given the low amounts of tectonic activity, we probably don't expect a lot of metamorphic uh, formation, rock formations uh, in many places on Mars.